Hello and welcome to part three of our special three-part webinar series today brought to you by CPA Practice Advisor Magazine and Walters Kluwer. This third webinar of the series is called What Does Innovation Mean for the Industry and Your Firm? I'm Gail Perry. I'm Editor-in-Chief of CPA Practice Advisor and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I'd like to explain how CPE will work for this webcast. Each of today's webcasts qualifies for one credit of continuing professional education. So one credit for this session. If you plan to earn CPE for attending this session, you must stay with us for a minimum of 50 minutes. In addition, we will display three polling questions during the webcast. In each poll, you need to record an answer as this is our verification that you are still watching the webcast. If you have any difficulty posting your answer to the polling questions, you can post that answer in the ask a question box on your screen and we'll record it there. Um, please note that we can give CPE credit for multiple people at the same location. So if there are others in your office who would like to attend this event at the same computer, please have them join you now. And at the end of the event, we'll have you send us their email addresses. Uh, at any time, you can enter questions in, in our chat area, which is the ask a question box provided on your screen. And our speakers will try to get to as many questions as possible during the presentation. Questions not answered during the broadcast will be addressed by the speakers afterwards via email. Also, please note that there is a resource links option on your screen. If you click that, you'll see that there is a white paper and also a brochure that have been provided by Walters Kluwer for you to download. Today, we are joined by Adam Orentlicker, Senior Vice President, Software Engineering for Walters Kluwer, and Stefan Davis, Lead Technology Product Manager for Walters Kluwer. Yeah. I will let them introduce themselves. We are now ready to begin. Okay. Adam, do you want to go first? Sure, I will go first. So, so <laughs> sure, Steph, I will go first. Yeah, so so I'm Adam Arentlicker. Um, I lead the tax and accounting North America engineering team. So essentially for all of you, this is really all technology for tax and accounting North America. So this is from application development, quality assurance and engineering, release management, and this is across all of our cloud and on-premises software. So we have, we have a lot of clients, such as all of you, um, millions of taxpayers across uh, a number of different market segments. Um, you know, we're here to talk a little bit about innovation, and it's a, it's a really good topic because here in Tax and Accounting North America, we're blazing the trail with transactional use of cloud. So everything from, you know, containerization to resiliency, reliability, maintainability, which is really all critical to what you demand from us. Um, and it really serves as a kick to, to keep us going. And I hope that we can teach you a little bit and, and explain to you how we all go about innovating and, and identification of innovations and trend spotting. Thanks, Adam. And my name is Steph Davis. I'm a, a product manager. Um, I work within the audit team. So I'm focused on working with our clients in the audit space to understand their needs and make sure that we're building products to make their life easier. So in terms of agenda today, um, the main points on the agenda here are looking at innovation generally, looking at why innovation should be part of every firm's culture, why data matters in that, how we can leverage the, the innovative actions of others in the industry to help your, you and your firm benefit, and then some step-by-step -step, um, things that you, you can do to in, encourage more innovation with your staff. So first of all, we're going to move into a polling question. Gail, are you okay to lead the polling question? I am. So here's our first polling question for you. Please answer, what is your primary line of business? And your options are tax, audit, consulting, operations, administrative, and other. So please choose the answer that's most closely aligned with your primary line of business and then click the submit button. And we'll let those answers fill in. And as I mentioned before, if you have any trouble answering that on screen, just answer it in the uh, ask a question box and we'll get, we'll get it there. So, and as these answers come in, it looks like we're 
getting about 75% of our participants in tax. Interestingly, uh, 8.5% in other. I'm kind of curious about what that is. But let's, uh, let's go ahead and send those results to the audience, and then we will be ready to continue with talking about our innovation philosophy. All right, back to you guys. So the first, the first question we look at is, how do we get started on improving our innovation philosophy? Um, Adam, can you help us with this? Sure, uh, absolutely. I'd be happy to do so, Steph. So how do we get started on adding or improving our innovation philosophy? It's a little bit of a, of a loaded answer. First thing is what we advocate for uh, for firms who are interested in innovating is really think of first thing you got to get a framework in place, and that is to be prepared to benefit from trends or mitigate disruption impact. And when I say disruption, it could be technical disruption or business disruption in this context. So we always advocate when looking at an innovation philosophy to look outside in first. Outside in being the market in. That includes looking at disruptions and trends. That's non-tech, so market, or technology market disruptions. Like the metaverse is a really good example of one in Web3. Look at market research, peer networking, a combination of data. The next, the next thing that's important is look at that disruption or trend specifically against the impact that it could have on you as a firm, um, as a business. It could be a business model. Impact could be a, a complete disruption to a core business philosophy that you might have. It could be a product impact. It could be an internal employee impact. It could be a customer impact. You have to assess that trend independently and in the context of the other trends to mitigate siloing. Because if you look at one trend specifically in a box, you could hyper-focus on it and actually miss the, the bigger picture. We also advocate that you have to have a time or a temporal horizon for the trend. Is it three months? Is it three years? Is it 10 years? Whatever it might be. And then prioritize. The output of this is a business architecture, not necessarily a technical architecture. It's more of a architecture, capabilities, the underlying assets, both tech and non-tech, and then timeline to, re to realize outcomes. Think of it as the first step is really a loose innovation plan in a box. So we also advocate, and this is really important, that it be accepted and approved at the senior executive level. Because the truth is, if it's if it's grassroots, grassroots works really, really well. But the truth is, when you're investing, there has to be acceptance all the way up. Otherwise, it will be much more difficult to realize. Okay, back to you, okay, Stephanie. So Sure. So what are some important considerations to bear in mind when innovating? So from my perspective on this, or from our perspective in Walters Kluwer, don't, don't underestimate the importance of the jobs to be done, the, specifically a jobs to be done framework. Okay. So Jobs to be done is a it's a term that was coined many years ago. I think it was popularized by a, a gentleman named Clayton Christensen, and it's been built into a set of formalized methodologies and tools that are leveraged by a variety of vendors. It's a prescriptive approach that starts with an understanding of the job that the persona, the user, the customer, the employee is trying to get done and then the metrics that that individual or individuals use to evaluate solutions to do that job. So by focusing on realistically what the end user or the customer wants to accomplish and knowing how value is measured, there's, able, there's an ability to focus R&D, development, marketing systemically to deliver on that value. That's one. Two, to ensure that there's capacity, sufficient capacity, and, and I would say a push to run experiments and, and do evaluation. 
because the truth is if there isn't capacity, and it could be small, it could be large, it really depends on your investment criteria and where you're going. Um, generally safe ideas, we find it's these quote safe ideas, or let's call it incremental features that are already associated with a roadmap will be funded. That's two. Three, think of a design thinking or agile perspective. Not every innovation or idea is going to bear fruit. So you have to take a tack that fail forward is really an industry term. You really should look at fail forward and other agile methodologies to, 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 to essentially walk a yellow brick road and pivot on the curves where necessary. Four, think of innovation as not a one size fits all model. So meaning there are different models, especially now in, in the post COVID era or the COVID era, depending on your perspective, could come from a meeting around a whiteboard, could come from a Microsoft Teams session or a Slack session. It could come from a hackathon, an innovation portal, they could come from different modalities and different collaboration methodologies. So you have to consider different approaches when determining the right approach to foster innovation for your business or your firm. And then number five is we recommend having at least one person, if not multiple people, dedicated to the process and then have a number of individuals on that core team to help seed and guide it. So I think a lot of accountants, just stepping back for a moment, a lot of accountants would say at the end of the day, I do my job and I've been doing my job for years and I serve my clients and it's really all about the numbers, right? So why is innovation important, particularly for CPA firms? Yeah, I mean, exactly. You might say, well, the industry's not changed in 50 years. We, we're still doing the same things we did when ledgers were paper. We're just doing it with a, an online system to record it. But the industry's changing massively. <laughs> it's incremental, but the whole accounting services industry is becoming more and more commoditized, which means that firms are finding it harder and harder to differentiate what they do compared to their competitors. If you look at the client base, we can't really rely on all the, the, the old relationships and the long-term clients that we've had for years. We need to keep winning new business. And if you look, for example, at the Fortune 100 in not 2005, only 20, 26 of those were still in the Fortune 100 nine years later. And that's not just huge com public companies. That trickles all the way down. So we need to be selling to new clients. But the way that we serve our longstanding clients is not necessarily the way that we need to serve our new clients. When you think about people, our people, the pipeline of new hires into the CPA industry is shrinking. Young CPAs are not so excited by the partner path or the money involved. They, they're looking for work-life balance. They want interesting work. They want to feel like they're valued and that they're having an actual, uh, like a significant impact on the work that they do. We need to be able to develop those, those talents from new generations to replace our retiring partners. The CPA market in general is very innovative especially when you look at the top end of the market, the largest firms, because they're in direct competition for all the largest clients, all the public companies. So to avoid being disruptive, the big four are constantly disrupting themselves. They're all investing a massive amount of money in, in, in constant innovation to stay a step ahead of their three biggest competitors. But that, diff that innovation then diffuses through the market down to the smaller and medium-sized firms and the smaller firms, and what you'll find is that the less innovative firms are risking being too late to adopt those new, new ways of working and new technologies, and the market will kind of be a step ahead of them all the time. Um, one quote that I find quite, quite apt in this is that you know, John F. Kennedy said that there are risks and costs to action. You, know, you have to make an investment to make a change, but those costs are far less than the long-range risks of comfortable inaction, just sitting and continuing to do what we do today. Okay, one thing I wanted to mention, you talked about the fact that, you know, we're, we're looking at new hires to bring innovation as well and fresh ideas and younger people coming into the firms. Are the schools keeping up or are they in the accounting programs or are they teaching the same things they taught 20 years ago? It's a bit of both. I think that the, the, the teaching is starting to evolve. We see we see universities and colleges using our software to train the CPAs of the future. Um, you know, things like data analytics, for example, colleges and universities are taking our analytics software and using that to start embedding those skills in CPAs now so that when they come into the firms, 
they are much more capable in those in those areas where firms typically struggle in some of those more more kind of new technologies. Okay, um, I think we are ready for our second polling question of this session, and that is, how does your firm measure innovation? And the options are through funding by allocating a budgetary amount through staffing by dedicating full-time resources, through time, measuring time the participants feel they can be creative, through learning, taking courses in emerging technologies, through, uh, through throughput, progressing ideas from intake to value, or we're not really measuring innovation. So choose the answer that's most appropriate for your firm and we'll give you a little bit of time to record those answers. And they are coming in. Let's give it about 10 more seconds. In eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and then let's go ahead and share these answers with our audience. It's looking like um, a lot of firms are participating in education, taking courses in emerging technologies, and there's a great percentage that haven't started actually measuring innovation yet. Yeah, not a huge surprise. So when those answers appear yeah. on your screen, after you look them over, you can click the little blue X to remove those so we can go back to the slides. All right, and then, so why do firms struggle to innovate? Yeah, so I was talking about this with my wife the other night and um, <laughs> we were just talking about innovation generally. She came with an example, it's like, why do we always cook the same thing for dinner? So you talk to your wife about that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. she's like, I feel like we eat all the same food all the time. But she's like, we're busy. You know, we struggle to find the time or just the headspace to think up or look up new recipes to cook. You know, maybe we're stuck in a rut. It works. Why change, why change the successful recipes that we cook every week? It requires conscious effort to do something different. It might require us to, to learn new skills you know, I might need to learn how to do some special cooking technique, which might take some more time and effort. It might require me to buy some special tools. I might need a spiralizer. You know, that that might require some investment. The bosses are resistant to change. And if your house is anything like mine, the bosses are the kids. The kids are quite happy with, you know, chicken nuggets and chips and spaghetti bolognese. You know, new innovations is not high on their agenda. And we fear failure. What, what if the family don't like the food and I have to scrape it in the bin? I've invested a lot of time, effort, money and ingredients all gone to waste. Now, I know that's a bit of a stupid analogy, but exactly the same things apply to our business lives and what happens in firms. And if we look at some other firm specific things, we work on the basis of billable hours largely. Any time that's not billable, billable is seen as not adding value. We, we measure the utilization of our staff. So you kind of have to stop adding value to then perform innovation. You know, we're all busy executing a known strategy that works has worked for years you know we don't necessarily have the time to go and look into to new innovations coming back to what adam mentioned earlier looking at the de demographics of our firms those making the decisions those who determine how we spend our time and invest our time you know they've been doing the same thing for many years They're, there's often a lot of pushback from certainly the more senior members of the team we're busier than ever post pandemic with the great res resignation we have staff shortages. We're trying, we're struggling just to get on with the daily work that we've got coming through the door. It's difficult to then say, actually, I'm going to also take some more time away from you to, to invest in innovation for the long-term gain. There's, you know, people are like, maybe we'll look at that next year. It's, you know, it's often not a good time. And this year is more of a challenge than many years. And, you know, people may look at the industry and go, oh, the pace of change is relatively, relatively slow. But technology is progressing faster than even the market's demanding. You're probably finding it's difficult to keep up with all the new technologies that's coming. So firms really need to increase the pace that they are, you know, getting familiar with technology. Now, 
we might consider that a lot of firms are relatively slow to adopt new technologies. We did a study last year. We asked them uh, what, which kind of category best describes your firm as it relates to the adoption of technologies. And 20% of the firms that responded considered themselves to be innovatives. They're the first to adopt a new technology. Another 40% considered themselves to be early adopters. So what does that mean? If you're not an innovative, innovator or early adopter, consider that 60% of your competitors are. So if you are not leading or at least in the early adopter category, you, you're probably going to be falling behind the pace of your set by your competitors. All right. So um, did you want to talk any more about this slide on the pace of technology adoption? No, that's fine. We okay, that's the, okay. So what Tell me in a little more detail, what is innovation culture? What do you mean by that? So I think I'll take that one, Gal. Um, so innovation culture, it's, it's a culture where innovation is an explicit priority, not implicit, but also where it begins with an insight, an idea for something new, whatever that something new might be where there's no tried or te tested example to review or validate it and no customer base, generally, generally speaking. The challenge in that type of model when you, when you have that class of, when you have that type of culture is you gotta have a test, you gotta have a test methodology to test the idea, to see if it makes sense for whoever the persona is or whatever market you're in. And if it has promise, iterate on it quickly and inexpensively. Because innovation, you have to, you know, generally you have to do tried and true. Because not every firm has, you know, billions and billions of dollars like the large technology firms that exist today. Um, there are many approaches that can be taken to exemplify and to enable this type of culture. Uh, one is design thinking, as I mentioned earlier. So bring ideas and tools from product design with a focus on human-centered design. So it really gets underneath what are the pain points and the jobs to be done for an individual. The second one is a lean startup methodology that provides a bit of an iteration engine that makes sense to build out a hypothesis for an innovation through different cycles of learning and continue to iterate and iterate and iterate over time. This is probably one of the most important uh, methodologies to use as part of an innovation cycle. And it ties well into Agile, which is really a, a, it's a, it's a philosophy to build out a supporting uh, technology or a tech solution through scale, right? So it's, it, it advocates for concepts like minimal viable product or market viable product. So you start small and then you grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, and grow over time. Okay, what okay. can firms do to foster a culture of innovation? So I, I can take this one, um, Gail. Um, so building on some of the things that Adam said um, earlier about kind of culture and having this innovation mindset, having a, the right environment to, in, it, uh, to innovate, you're, to become it, innovative, you need st your staff to be comfortable with sharing their ideas. You need to va value their input. You need to be able to reward their creati creativity. I'm not saying we need to necessarily pay them money, but you know, recognize their creativity, recognize the value of the suggestions they're coming up with, giving people time, some space to innovate, maybe pulling them away from the day job for uh, certain periods, for small periods, so that they can actually focus on innovation. Staff need to be able to understand you know, what's out there. They need to be able to gain knowledge about what's going on in the, in the market, what's going on in technology. So giving them time to attend training courses, conferences, webinars like this, events, there are so many free learning opportunities. Aside from the time costs, learning opportunities are free all over the place that you, know, you don't need to be paying large amounts of money for training courses. You need to make sure that you know, people are, we spend all of our time working with the same team. Often we're working in the same department with the same tax advisors, maybe consider creating opportunities for them to collaborate with people, not in their direct team. So maybe in the audit function or the advisory function or the IT department, um, being able to look outside of their normal kind of sphere is often a real, uh, real good kind of impetus for innovation. 
and you know we're accountants we're we're a little bit uptight sometimes we need to consider loosening up a little bit i'm not saying go full google and put table tennis tables in every office but you need to make sure your environment's conducive to innovation you know having spaces where people can collaborate maybe having whiteboards all over the wall areas where people are not just you know doing tax computations but they can come together and be more creative together maybe a couple of bean bags can be thrown in as well <laughs> going back to kind of the process of innovation as adam was saying fail forward fail fast and move on celebrate failure if you failed at something you've tried something and it failed but it's moved you forward that's that's something to celebrate measure your results Build on your successes, and then when you do fail, pivot quickly. Don't waste time lamenting the failures. Every failure is good. Uh, when we're talking about people as well, you know, making sure people are empowered. Often you've got certain people in the team who are coming up with ideas all the time. They're the innovat innovators. Consider putting them into a formal role, like an innovation champion, to help draw innovation out of their colleagues. And, and again, to what Adam said, make sure somebody is in charge of leading innovation from the top to make sure that there is there is an organizational impetus to do this. And finally, you know, change management. This is a, everything comes back to change management. Change management is hard. Communication is key. Telling the story of what we're trying to achieve as a firm, making sure that we've got full buy in from the top, even the crusty old partners who are not interested make sure that they at least appear to be brought into the innovation philosophy and culture. So one thing I want to add, Steph, on this, on fostering a culture of innovation, I, I want to bring in a little bit of a of, a, of something that we were, let, were heavily looking at within Walters Kluwer into this. It's called the employment value proposition. And it's a new term that has been coined, and it's relative new, um, but it's been, it's been around for a little bit. But having innovation be a core part of development opportunities for the people, like as you mentioned here, Steph, is also fundamental for fostering culture, right? So through explicit innovation, so for example, finding or dedicating a team, also curriculum, coursework, coursework but also implicit trying to guide projects to use more innovative concepts and technology to, to align with customer value and customer needs is also fundamental. And it all ties back into this employment value proposition that helps from a talent attraction and retention perspective. So it is a big circle in the end. Yeah. So let's, Talk about those crusty partners you mentioned just a moment ago. And, <laughs> and let me be a little Not bit. Not to offend yeah. to anyone on the call. Crusty but, partners. Um, say you're in a firm with, you know, the management is focused on getting the job done. And we do our job and we do it well. And, um, yeah, innovation sounds great. But when do we have time to innovate? You know, because we're already working more than full time. So, how, what advice can you give to either younger people in the firm who maybe could step up and guide the way or even to the management who says, I don't have time to think about this? Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a partner, I'm running a business. It's my business. It's my money at the end of the day. It's me who's who's trying to keep the, the business going and the doors open. But, you know, yeah, you're a younger person in the firm. You're full of ideas. I think the main thing is being able to communicate those back to the person at the top who, you know, if you can communicate the value of an idea, and, and you know, as product people, that's what we're doing all day. Before we can invest in an idea, we need to say, we need to prove that there's value in this. So taking innovations to a certain level and being able to present it to a partner and say, yeah, this is going to take some investment. Maybe we're going to have to take a little bit of time out, but I can save five hours on every tax return or made them that's yeah. a little bit extreme. That'd be fantastic. But if you can communicate to the partner, then they at least can make an investment decision. They can trade off the pros and cons and make a rational decision. I know most partners are pretty rational people. If you can make that rational proposition to them, then, then at least they can start to see the, the value of innovation. Tie it, tie it to an objective and key result in OKR or a KPI. So like Steph mentioned as an example, saving five hours on a tax return. Yeah, that might be hard, but you could use concepts like robotic process automation, RPA, as a really good example, right? RPA 
an element of RPA is literally um, recording user mouse clicks synthetically. I hate to say it like that, but it, that's just, it's one of many elements of RPA. And to, to help eliminate repetitive, mundane, simple tasks or automate them, not necessarily eliminate, eliminate them through automation, eliminate the human factor of it, that is an area that at least we see from a, a firm perspective, an area of heavy investment. Okay. okay, so are there specific models that people can turn to um, for innovating as a process? Uh, yes, ma'am. There are no lack of models. <laughs> um, no, but in, but in reality here, there are many different models, but the truth is there's not, really, there's not really any single approach that's ideal for any one organization. Um, th the truth of the matter is here, the model itself may, it does not necessarily need to be complex and it doesn't necessarily even need to be highly formal. It also might not necessarily even be linear it's really a, it's more of a, it's more of a circle that you have, that you can go back and forth and back and forth at the different elements of, um, as you're actually doing innovation. But what I would say is the key areas that I would say to focus on, first one is jobs to be done. I already talked about that, but I think it's important that you have capacity to run experiments. You identify what I would call drop points that make sense along the process. So uh, common points of failure that impede the flow of innovation, such as idea collection, ideas that can't find a home, right? I mean, that's a really good example, right? Uh, demonstrations, demonstrating proof of concepts that everybody likes, but don't necessarily win a place. So right, identify drop points in the process and don't miss those. Um, the third one I would say is uh, examine the effectiveness of each stage, right? We had a question already in this, uh, in this presentation on, um, um, on the, on the different, on the different um, stages of, of let's call it measuring innovation. And really not a lot of firms, a large percentage appear not to be measuring innovation, um, but really have measurements along with each stage to make sure it's supporting overall goals. Okay. And then, and also look at alternative approaches to fulfill each stage. So, you know, a good example is uh, many firms set up uh, ideation portals or innovation portals. Some firms that works well based on the culture, some firms it doesn't. Okay. Don't give up. It might be better to do it more interactively, collect the ideas more interactively in a hackathon or a shark tank like idea, uh, idea generation process. Um, you could also bring in multiple processes into a single flow. As long as you get to really an end result that drives, in my opinion, our opinion, jobs to be done, and then a lean startup-like methodology to test it, prove it, get market feedback, generally speaking, thumbs up. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you've got a really intense slide coming up here um, about activities to organize innovation programs and initiatives. And before you tell us about this slide... Um, <laughs> I want to point out that this slide was created in 2018, and I'm sure it's all still totally relevant, but I'm wondering if there, when you speak to this, if there are any changes that may have occurred since COVID that would alter some of the information that you're going to present here. That's a really, that is an outstanding, that is an outstanding point, uh, Gal. The, the, big one, the, the big area I would say that, cha that has changed is now the hybrid work environment, simply put, right? In many cases, pre the pandemic, innovation was, uh, it, it, they, they were what are called serendipitous ideas, light bulb, light bulb ideas that came from face-to-face -face interactions. They may have come from um, your firm's customer interactions. They may have come from whiteboarding sessions, whatever it might be. Now, you have to be a little bit more receptive to the different modalities, which is the really the reality of the hybrid workforce, right? The fact that in many cases, individuals are sitting at a desk by themselves, and that could be in an office, that could be at home, that could be working on a Teams meeting, that could be in person, that could be in an off-site meeting. So there's 
There are different modalities now, both synchronous and asynchronous work, both in office and at home that have to be considered. And what this is, is really just meant to be a little bit of reference for all of you. This is a, it's a, it's a recommendation from Gartner on activities to organize innovation programs and initiatives. And you can see it's a lot of what we've already talked about here, right? Look at your organizational design and approaches to innovation in learn, in prepare, create business targets. We talked about OKRs and KPIs, the importance of having metrics, um, creating an innovation charter, establishing a governance process, communications, right? Steph, Steph is it's absolutely true. You have to communicate not only failures and do blameless postmortems, but communicate successes as well to the organization because even celebrating failures helps breed success. Um, measurement, we talked about measurement, execution, lean startup, resource allocation. Don't try to do this. My advice is you could try to do small projects on a shoestring budget, it makes sense, but having someone facilitate the process is really important if this is truly an organizational priority or a business priority for um, your organization. And then of course, training, as well as leadership in constantly communicating explicitly, and we'll talk a little bit about how Walters Kluwer does this later, but constantly communicating the environment for innovation and the importance of it. Okay, so what can firms do? How should they approach introducing innovation into what they do on a daily basis? Yeah, and yeah, as Adam said, he's going to talk about this, how we do things in Walters Clear in a moment. I mean, innovation is our day job. That's the difference. We're, our job is to come up with new innovative solutions to help people like you do your jobs. Um, but how do we innovate within the firm? So looking at innovating the way that we do what we do, one nice technique is just to imagine what the firm looks like in five or 10 years' time. That's quite useful because it takes you out of the, the grounding of today to look a little bit more futurist. And automation is a biggie. You know, we talked about the, the, the commoditization of the market. We want to address that head on. We don't want to be the people who suffer that. We want to make sure that the things that are commoditizable, the things that um, we do repetitively, we want to automate those as much as possible. So, you know, often we've hit a lot of the low hanging fruit. Maybe we've got tax return software, which makes our lives a lot easier there. Adam talked a little while ago about RPA, robotic process automation. That's really useful when we want to automate the links between different things. So maybe we've got a practice management tool and we've got a, a, an audit tool and a tax tool and we want to be able to pass information and coordinate activities between those. Imagine something like client onboarding. We might not have one single system for that. There might be lots of different steps involved. Tools like RPA are much, much more accessible now and allow you to do in-house that automation without having to necessarily go and buy all of your tools from one vendor. Thinking about how we innovate the things that we do, the processes that we do, and the technologies we use, the big four, they've got the resources to build their own tools, develop their own methodologies in-house. But look to third-party vendors. I've talked a little bit about you know, the things that other vendors can offer. They're, as I say, we're in the business of innovation. We're, it's our job to bring to you innovations which help you to make your life easier. And consider that big innovation doesn't have to be all big bang. It doesn't have to be revolutionary innovation. Those micro innovations, saving five minutes here, five minutes there on a process that you do very regularly, those micro innovations can really add up to some really significant benefits. And then it's kind of innovating, not, not how we do the work we do now, but innovating the work that we actually do, the things that we actually focus on. Think about productizing your services. Think of the services you offer like a product. Think like a product manager. Wherever the growth there is in the market, what are the new service lines that we can invest in? Think about the big four. They leap on new opportunities. ESG, for example, every big four firm has announced billions of dollars investment in this. PwC are planning to spend $12 billion over the next five years just on building an ESG practice. So think about product information. Think in, innovation think about niches that are not met where you can develop a product to fill that and by mean product i mean a service in in the case of a firm also think about the client experience collect and client feedback around how they experience working with you how can we innovate that client experience to use that as a differentiator 
And, you know, the normal things that we should be doing is looking at the product or service profitability and our client profitability. Are there services that are just not profitable? Are there clients that we just need to ditch because, you know, we just can't do the audit in an efficient way and we can't raise the price? And think about your firm's competitive strengths and weaknesses. Where are you strong? Are there certain industries where you have knowledge that none of the firms around you have? Where can you go and make new opportunities with those those skills and and, and assets that you have in the organization? We go back to that, that study we did last year um, and kind of the, the, the top goals of firms. Um, and, and I think you've got available, uh, these slides are available to see what they are. But I just wanted to contrast the priorities when we look at firms as a whole. So at the top of there, top strategic goal, streamlining workflows and processes, improving project tracking management. You know, those obviously make sense. But when we contrast the innovators, so we saw at the beginning people class themselves as innovators, they're focusing a lot less on things like streamlining internal workflows and processes. And if you look down the bottom, they're putting much more emphasis on things like enhancing their CRM system, outsourcing services, outsourcing internal office management things. Those are more innovative ways to make money, not just looking at how do we do how do we do what we do now better, but how do we change what we do and the way that we deliver stuff to, to actually be a little bit more innovative. Um, and the same thing with growth tactics. I'll skip straight to the, the, innovata the innovator slide on here. They're looking down at the bottom where other people are not necessarily looking, at adding new services, expanding the current services they offer, partnering with other vendors to be able to deliver additional services that they can't deliver in-house, but maybe pass on some of the cost to their customers. So considering not just how you do, innovating how you do things, but, but what you do as well. Can you guys add any pointers on how firms should prioritize their strategic goals? Yeah, I, it's tricky because it's firm by firm. Um, and it, going back to what Adam said at the beginning, it's understanding where your threats are, where your disruption is coming from. And, and you, the, you know, a small local firm may have completely different disruption than a very large national firm. You may have a firm next that's just down the road from you that's winning all your business because they have something which they're offering their clients. Maybe it's the client experience or maybe they're just undercutting you. But understanding where your biggest disruptors are is probably a good place to start. If, you, if you're not experiencing significant disruptors, probably the areas where you think you can make the most impact. Okay. Adam, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on prioritization. Uh, well, I think it really comes down to, from my perspective, Steph, um, you know, aligning with the overall business objectives, right? O aligning with overall business objectives, um, aligning with a framework that takes into account uh, existing customer needs, prospective or new business needs, as well as individuals who, or, or, for, or businesses who might be evaluating your product, taking that into account and more or less prioritizing, right? I mean, I, I think in reality, Steph, you got it. I think you answered it strong. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about data. And what does data have to do with innovation? Yeah, and I'll, I'll go through this one a little bit quickly, because I know we're running a little bit short on time. But um, data is really important to make the right decisions. So having innovation driven by data prevents you from making assumptions. You're basing you know, your decisions on more sound data, and maybe the part of the innovation is collecting the data to be able to, to support um, you know, the, the hypotheses that you're making. And when you're looking at trying to find the opportunities for auto automation data, such as detailed time tracking, where are people spending or wasting their time? What would make good candidates for automation? Uh, you know, and there's lots of other examples looking at our client accounting data to find our profitable clients and so on. Um, data is a really useful resource in helping you to focus the innovation that you use. Okay. How do software vendors support innovation in firms? So going back to kind of mentioned this earlier, think about the big four, the people who are disrupting the industry. They've got tons of money to invest in building their own teams of developers and technologists. Most firms don't have that. You want innovation that works today. You don't want to spend three years building something and getting the value at the end of that. There are products, and you, you, you're probably hearing through the industry, new products coming to you all the time for, for evaluation, wanting your attention. But companies like us are out there innovating as our day job, coming up with new solutions. We know your firms. 
you know, our product team's made up of CPAs largely. Largely, you know, we're we're taking all that cost of development and amortizing that, to use an accounting term, over lots of different firms. We can afford to make a much bigger investment in a piece of technology than you as a firm could afford to make it on your own. And, yeah. and yeah, we work with many, many firms. It's not just taking the ideas of one firm. It's taking our ideas, and we obviously seed ideas from other firms. Firms come to us with their ideas for new innovations that they want, want our help with. And, and products can really be a catalyst for innovating your processes. So take example of bringing in a new workflow tool, for example. That may be the impetus to transform your client onboarding process because you now have a tool that makes that easy and much more streamlinable. You can innovate the actual process. The other thing, Gail, I just want to add, wait, hold on, Gail. Can I, I want to add something um, to what Steph just said. Another another fairly sizable investment area for us in tax and accounting North America is around APIs. Now, the truth of the matter is APIs, in air quotes, probably don't mean much to you preparing your taxes or you preparing your customers' taxes. But the truth is they mean a lot to supporting innovation. By having APIs, as an example, you enable you can enable a flywheel effect. So in, what I mean by that is you could bring third-party solutions. Maybe it's, for example, cryptocurrency vendors. Maybe it could be, um, it, you know, it could be other third-party solutions for tax automation, import, export, all of that in analytics, data analytics. There are a variety of solutions that could be brought to bear to help enable integration around the core, if that makes sense. And when you, when you talk about concepts like we're investing here around a data lake, which is really meant to bring data close to compute to enable artificial intelligence and analytics, that those are example concepts on how we are supporting innovation in firms for all of you. Okay. So how does Walters Kluwer approach innovation philosophically? I'll leave this one to you, Adam. <laughs> ah, you're leaving the you're leaving the, the hardball ones to me. Um, so <laughs> I will. <laughs> so I'll break this down in two areas, and I'll make it relatively simple. Okay. Um, the first one is is from from we we have we have explicit programs in Walters Kluwer to drive innovation. So. I'll give you two examples. One is we run a program. It's called uh, Code Games. We run it annually, okay? And what Code Games is really meant to be is it's two to three days, depending on the location of the region, where we have customer feedback, all of you, market data, market feedback that comes in, bridged or compared and contrasted with trend spotting, innovations that are occurring in the market, and then we literally seed a large group of developers that are that are broken up into small teams with an, with essentially a program to enable incubation aligned with the innovations. They're almost all focused on jobs to be done. What is the problem that we're solving? What are the steps and variables? What do we believe the market impact will be? After, after that, that small two-day uh, session, which candidly, we do have some of our customers helping with voting during, um, there is an evaluation process where we look at that lean startup methodology via Agile and to, to determine what do we do with them? Do we invest? How do we invest in them? Do they have market applicability? Should they become features of products, independent products, whatever it might be? Do we need to do further proof of concept? So we have that. The second explicit sorry, area of focus. Just, just, yeah, just sorry, yeah. I'm just going to link that back to what we were talking about earlier about taking time away from the day job. Now, we're busy delivering roadmaps. The, the, the really great thing about Code Games is that it's, it's fun. Everyone wants to be involved in Code Games because the day job is almost turned off for two days. You get to focus on a pet project, something you're interested in, like a cool technology that you think could apply to our customers and spend a couple of days building something real that works, that actually does something within a small team. Obviously, we go back to our day job. But at the end of that, we've got I – mean, we did code games last year, last week. We've you know, Even in the audit team, we've got like 20 new things that we've got to go and work out how we actually put on the roadmap because they're so exciting and they've been proven out in real software 
that you know we want to actually go ahead and actually deliver those. Exactly, love it. We also ha we have also an ideas portal and a, and an approach. It's called the Global Innovations Award. It's been running in Walters Clerk as a company for. 12 years now? You have to help me, Steph, if I'm off. That's I think it's about 12 years now. <laughs> um, and essentially, the way it works is uh, individuals or teams submit ideas in three different categories, uh, internal process improvements, game changers, or enhancing the core. So you can, in, you can probably interpret through what those three categories are. And then there is an assessment process, a bit of a shark tank-like assessment process that we go through over a number of months. And an idea that is selected ends up looks ends up getting funded and becoming real in a project. Um, and we've had multiple such examples in Walters Clue, an example of CCH Validate. That's an example in Steph Space that was part of the Global Innovations Awards that actually became real in product. So those two, I would say, are more explicit programs. But then what we have is we have more implicit innovation and it's implicit, borderline explicit that occurs just as part of our normal day jobs, right? It's every day there is something new that is that is that hits my desk, whether it be something to help with resiliency, reliability as a result of a, an, a, a customer event, whether it be a concept that an engineer has that we believe will have rapid market impact or impact to our, to our firms and our customers. And we bring that through a lean agile methodology as well as our product management road mapping methodology in order to be triaged as part of the roadmap. That happens regularly. That happens regularly. Um, we also have extensive learning, uh, career lattices, career paths for our engineers and individuals and that employment value proposition that I mentioned previously to help foster innovation. All right, excellent. Um, I would like to introduce the third polling question at this time. So the th third and final polling question is, would you like more information about technologies you've heard about today? And your answer options are yes, I'd like more information for purchase decisions we are considering within the next 12 months. Yes, I'd like more information to prepare for future decisions. I'm not currently considering new technology, but I am interested in ways to improve our business. Or finally, thanks, I'm just here for the CPE. So choose the answer that's most appropriate for you and hit the submit button in order to send that through. Again, if you have any problem answering the question online, you can put it in the, put your answer in the ask a question box and we will record it there. Um, we want to thank all of you, particularly Stefan and Adam, for an amazing presentation today. We'd like to thank all of you who attended and shared your time with us. We would like to thank Walters Kluwer for allowing us to offer a free CPE credit for this and for the two earlier webinars today, too, if you attended the whole um, trio of webinars. Thank you for spending three hours with us. Um, we also would like to uh, just remind you that there are two resources available in the resource links section on your screen, a white paper and a brochure. So if you have not downloaded those yet, you might wanna do so before we finish this presentation, which we're about to. If you have any questions about CPE, you can reach me directly at gperry, G-P-E-R-R-Y, at cpapracticeadvisor.com. If more than one person watched this webinar with you on the same machine and you need to get their names recorded for uh, CPE credit, just send me their names and email addresses. That is gperry at cpapracticeadvisor.com. We're going to post a post-event evaluation on the screen in the moment. It's an optional evaluation, but we'd appreciate your time to just answer a few questions about how we did and what we can do to improve our webinar series going forward. Thank you again to everybody. This has been a great day and our audio is going to end now.